I see people today claim that caring about issues such as immigration is some distortion by the modern left that has abandoned class issues. This position, I think, comes from general historical illiteracy. The left has always considered immigration an important issue. Even amongst a chauvinistic second international is considered important, and very pro-immigration views were the norm. So this is going to be a little bit different from my other videos. I'm going to give a breakdown of some of the people involved in this debate at the Second International. But the main body, this is going to be an exchange between delegates at a Congress in 1907 discussing the issue. Diving in, let's take a look at some of the delegates. Apologies ahead of time for my inability to pronounce things. Manuel Ugarte was a representative from the Argentinian Socialist Party. When World War I broke out, he took an anti-imperialist position against the war. For this, he would end up being removed from the party and eventually drifted away from socialism. Morris Hilquit, who would be a delegate from the American Socialist Party, was born in Riga, Latvia, to a family of German-speaking Jews. He went to a Russian school due to the limitation on Jews in the Russian Empire meant he was not able to attend a German school. In 1886, he would immigrate to New York. In the following year, he would join the Socialist Labor Party and become active in its Jewish section. He helped set up newspapers appealing to Jewish immigrants and publishing things in Yiddish. Though, he expressed he would prefer to organize amongst Americans and dislike the ethnic separation within the Socialist Labor Party. Eventually, Hillquit would fight with Daniel De Leon and form an anti-De Leon faction and eventually split. And that split would join with Victor Berger and Eugene V. Debs to form the Socialist Party of America. While in the Socialist Party, he would run for mayor for New York and Congress several times unsuccessfully. And generally, he was considered part of the party's right wing. When reading up on him, I actually kind of find Hillquit to be an interesting person. I don't necessarily agree with him, but if people want, I might do a longer video on him. Let me know in the comments. Charles Rapoport would be the delegate from France. He was born to a Jewish family in Tsarist Russia. He was active in the Russian Revolutionary Movement before being forced into exile. He would become naturalized in France and contribute to many socialist journals. He was active in the Second International and was an opponent of World War I. While initially critical of the Bolsheviks, he would eventually join the French Communist Party in the Third International. He eventually would resign, however, in 1938 in response to the trial of Bukharin. Joseph Denner Denes would be the representative from Hungary. He was a prominent Hungarian social democrat, eventually became part of the Hungarian government until the dictatorship. William L. M. Bogan was a founding member and delegate from the Austrian Social Democratic Party. He was a pacifist during World War I. He joined the Social Democratic government in Austria after the war. Eventually was forced to flee Austria during the rise of fascism. Tokjiro Kato was a representative of the short-lived Japanese Socialist Party, which existed for a brief period between 1906 and 1908. It fell apart, and shortly after, Japanese socialism would be pretty much destroyed following the High Treason Incident, which was a plot to assassinate the Japanese emperor. This resulted in a brutal crackdown on leftists in Japan. Following that, he went on to just run a clinic for the poor. Julius Hammer, a representative from the Socialist Labor Party, actually had a hard time finding out a ton on him, most information comes from a short description and articles and things about his son, who was a rather interesting person. Julius Hammer was a Russian Jew who lived in Odessa before immigrating to the USA and living into the Bronx, where he ran a medical practice. He would later go on to help found the Communist Party USA, and in 1921, he would be arrested for performing an abortion. Now you know a bit about the delegates whose speeches we'll be reading a portion of, but I feel we need to cover a bit of the backstory of exactly why this occurred, and it starts with an American socialism. At this time, in American Socialism, there was two main parties, the Socialist Labor Party with Daniel De Leon as its leader, and was started as a dissident faction from the Socialist Labor Party led by Morris Hillquit, and merged with Victor Berger's and Eugene V. Debs' Social Democratic Party to form the Socialist Party. Also remember at this time, Social Democrat meant Marxist. Lenin regarded himself as a Social Democrat, so don't attach our modern understanding of social democracy to it. Victor Berger is one we will talk about later, specifically his response to this Congress. I would hope most of you know at least a little bit about Eugene V. Debs. During the aughts of the 1900s, there was a growing desire to get the American Federation of Labor on the side of the Socialist Party and voting for them. But the American trade union movement was extremely racist and a major issue for them was specifically Asian immigration at this time. To win the support of the leaders of the AFL it would mean supporting a restriction of immigration from Asia. But well, this was an issue for the Socialist Party, as the Second International broadly was pro-immigration and against restrictions on it. There was to be a Congress in 1904, and both Morris Hillquit and Daniel D. Leon acted as representatives at the Congress. Hillquit, alongside delegates from Holland and Australia, submitted a resolution saying they would support their government's attempts to exclude people of backwards races. Now, Wikipedia claims to have the text of this resolution, as you can see here on screen. 
you may pause to read it. However, it lacks a citation for it, and it seems to imply Daniel De Leon was the author of sorts. Every source I have said I've seen says he is pro immigration, and there is evidence to say he was. And that's not to say he wasn't racist. He did oppose combating lynching as that was a petty bourgeois issue, but he did not support this resolution. The Socialist Labor Party under him was actually attacked by the Socialist Party as being an immigrant party, so I don't think he had a part in drafting this resolution, and Wikipedia is misrepresenting his views on this. My best guess is someone got it from a book that has it in there, and it is quoting him reporting on the resolution, but I can't confirm this for sure. I did find what I think might be the resolution published in the Socialist Party's newspaper, but it's on microfilm and part of it's damaged, and it doesn't tell me where this resolution's from, but the text looks pretty similar, and it was published in the paper uh, talking about that Congress. I shared what I think the resolution text is on Twitter, um, and I'm going to put it up on screen if you want to read through it, but I'm not for the sake of time. Anyway... The 1904 Congress decided to shelve the issue until it could be brought up more fully at the next Congress. In the intervening years, the Japanese Socialist Party became aware of the attacks on Japanese and Chinese workers in America and sent a letter to them calling on them to take a stronger position on this. Even though I would hope most of you are aware to some extent of the horrible conditions of Asian immigrants were under at this time, I want to provide a brief overview of the laws and things and the conditions of Asian immigrants at this time. A lot of this started in 1875. Congress trying to bypass a treaty that would ban Chinese people coming to the U.S. for work, and they banned women who were coming over to become prostitutes, was the word of the law. However, the way this was implemented, it essentially was an excuse for them to ban women, which later they would just explicitly ban women altogether. And this isn't the only time the U.S. would do this. The U.S. would also later do this to women from the Philippines. The goal of this is, of course, to cause this population to die out and to get rid of it. At this time, too, it was also impossible for a Chinese person to become naturalized in the U.S. There was also lynchings of Chinese and other Asian migrants. For example, one of the worst mass lynchings was in 1871 in Los Angeles. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act would bar most Chinese immigrants. Initially, it was supposed to be temporary, but it was renewed in 1892 and 1902. It would be partially repealed in 1943, but it was just replaced with a system that restricted Chinese immigration to essentially nothing, and that would not be abolished until 1965. I am trying to provide a brief overview here and not really getting into the depth of these horribly racist policies. You really should do some further reading on this. All this was really just a start to a broad opposition and targeting of Asian immigrants in general. In the period following the Chinese Exclusion Act, Organizations like the Asiatic Exclusion League would be formed. The Knights of Labor also ramped up with their anti-Asian sentiments. They directly participated in violent acts on immigrants, like the 1885 exclusion of Chinese people from Tacoma, Washington, as well as the Rock Springs Massacre, which resulted in the death of 28 to 50 Chinese miners carried out by white miners who were mostly involved with the Knights of Labor. Exclusionist movements also argue that Japanese immigrants as being untrustworthy and without morals, as well as scares about race mixing. After 1905, the Russo-Japanese War, much of this racist propaganda started to focus on the idea of invading Asian hordes as part of the aid of an eventual Japanese invasion of the West Coast. This sort of dual loyalty thing has been applied to many groups in many countries. One modern example of this sort of rhetoric can be seen today with Chinese students being seen as agents of China and there being calls to ban them. So it's important to know that the American labor movement at this time was very racist, either in the case of some groups directly leading these massacres and lynchings or simply ignoring it and keeping their unions white only. This was the background that caused the Japanese Socialist Party to write a letter to American socialists basically asking them to quit being so racist and to do something about this and come to the aid of Japanese and Chinese workers. This was published in the Socialist Party Official Bulletin, Volume 3, January 1907. In the interest of time, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but you can look it up if you want. It's on Marxist.org. The Socialist Papers of America have not been quite clear in their general attitude towards the Japanese expulsion question, and comrades of Japan are asking whether or not American socialists are going to be true to the exhortations of Marx, working men of all countries unite, or whether they are encouraging uh, contention and division on the grounds of race prejudice. We believe that the expulsion question of Japanese laborers in California is much due to racial prejudice. The Japanese Socialist Party therefore hopes that the American Socialist Party will endeavor to bring the question to a satisfactory issue according to the spirit of international unity among working men. We also ask the American Socialist Party to acquaint us with its opinions as to this question. 
this would go unanswered. In this same issue, I think I might have found the translated reprint of the amendment proposed at the 1904 Congress. The issue is the preceding paragraphs explaining what it is in full is damaged on the scan. It is part of a call from Hillquit for the party to draft a resolution for the 1907 Congress, as issues of immigration will be talked about there. In March, the National Executive Committee adopted it, and following that, in April, the National Committee of the Socialist Party adopted it with 46 voting yes and only 3 voting no and 11 abstained. I'm going to read the demand portion of their resolution that they were to submit to the Stuttgart Congress. This can be found in the April 1907 edition of the Socialist Party Official Bulletin. Fully recognizing the above considerations, the Congress therefore declares it to be the duty of socialists and organized workingmen of all countries. 1. To advise and assist bona fide workingmen immigrants in their first struggles on the new soil, to educate them to the principles of socialism and trade unionism, to receive them in their respective organization, and to collect them in the labor movement of the country of their adoption speedily as possible. 2. To counteract the efforts of misleading representations of capitalist promoters by publication and wide circulation of truthful reports of the labor conditions of their respective countries, especially through the medium of International Bureau. 3. To combat with all means at their command the willful importation of cheap foreign labor calculated to destroy labor organizations, to lower the standard of living of the working class, and to retard the ultimate realization of socialism. The Congress calls upon socialist representatives in the parliaments of various countries to introduce legislation along the general lines laid down in the resolution, as well as legislating tending to secure immigrated working men full civil and political rights in the countries of their adoptions as speedily as possible. The Congress leaves it to the various national organizations to apply the principles herein announce the specific needs and conditions of their respective countries. Gone was the language of backwards races. Now, I don't think this is because the American socialists had a change of heart. I think it is obvious that this was well thought out to be as palpable to the International Congress after the very negative reaction they got at the 1904 proposal. But this was the resolution unaltered to my knowledge they submitted to the 1907 Stuttgart Congress. Now let's go look at some of the debate on this at the 1907 Congress. I am pulling the bits from John Riddle's Lenin's Struggle for Revolutionary International. We Argentine comrades raise the question of immigration and emigration at this Congress for the following reasons. We want to combat only artificial immigration, that is, immigration carried out by the capitalist government agencies to obtain cheap labor to compete with organized workers. Our comrades also demand measures against the shipping company's exploitation of immigrants. This is not a racial question, and the resolution is not anti-Chinese or anti-Japanese. Argentina should be open to all workers, but workers should be advised of the working and living conditions of any countries which they wish to immigrate. The Argentine comrades are proposing two resolutions to this end. One demands the emigrating workers be informed about the conditions of work. The other demands that the progress of naturalization in the different countries be made easier so that workers can immediately acquire political rights in their new place of residence. Morris Hillquit, a representative for the United States. Immigration and emigration pose a very difficult, serious problem. Our resolution in no way infringes on the principle of internationalism, which has always been our guide in the United States. There are several kinds of immigration. The first is natural immigration, which arises from the very nature of the capitalist economy. For these immigrants, we demand full freedom, and we consider it the workers' duty to assist the poor among them. Another kind of immigration must be sharply distinguished from the first. Basically, it amounts to capitalism's importation of foreign labor cheaper than that of native-born workers. This threatens the native-born with dangerous competition and usually provides a pool of unconscious strike breakers. Chinese and Japanese workers play that role today, as does the yellow race in general. While we have absolutely no racial prejudice against the Chinese, we must frankly tell you that they cannot be organized. Only a people well advanced in its historical development, such as the Belgian and Italians in France, can be organized for the class struggle. The Chinese have lagged too far behind to be organized. Socialism is by no means sentimentalism. A fierce struggle rages between capital and labor. And those who stand against organized labor are our enemies. Do we want to grant privileges to foreign strike breakers when they are locked in a struggle with native-born workers? If we fail to take measures against the immigration of Chinese strike breakers, we will thrust the socialist workers' movement backwards. While the French resolution undermines the principle of class struggle, ours holds it high. We do not insist on its every word, but we hope you will adopt a resolution with its general approach. And from Joseph Denair Dines, a representative from Hungary. Those countries that cannot be organized today will be organized tomorrow. 
Moreover, in backward countries, this evolution proceeds more rapidly than it did in countries that developed earlier, such as England and Germany. Only 10 years ago, our Hungarian workers emigrating to America were considered unorganizable. Today, only a few years later, they are being organized and are inspired with the spirit of socialism. You want to erect protective barriers around the workers. This will land you in the same fiasco as have tariff-building efforts of capitalists. If the wage question were merely one of supply or demand, we would have to oppose the importation of agricultural machinery, since it has replaced more workers than the Japanese and Chinese, especially in the Eastern European countries. We must permit completely free immigration and emigration. A great many American workers are wage conscious, but not yet imbued with a proletarian class consciousness. Of course, we must fight against the abuses that stem from the mass importation of workers for the capitalist benefit, but through explanation and organization. A good method would be to press for the establishment of a minimum wage, where possible, through political means, otherwise through trade union struggle. Charles Rapoport, a representative from France. We cannot accept a quid stock of predestined strike breakers. So long as a worker does not act as a strike breaker, we treat him as a comrade. We too want to take a stand against immigration organized by the capitalists to break contracts, but not by fighting against the workers involved. William Ellen Bogan, a representative from Austria. The discussion is moving in two opposed directions. Some speak for the interests of the country of immigration and others for the emigrants. No reconciliation appears possible between these two points of view, but we must combine them and make provisions for both sides. This is best done by excluding from the outset measures unacceptable to socialists, such as guild-like and discriminatory laws. I hope Comrade Hillquip will not be offended, but I cannot accept his resolution because it is not clearly formatted. We should avoid distinctions such as those between natural and unnatural immigration, which are slippery and hard to define. However, we do have a number of positive measures in which the main tasks fall to the trade unions. The unions should reach out to countries of emigration and educate the emigrants there, as the German trade unions have done to such exemplary fashion. They must also try to prevent the export of strike breakers. Most important, trade unions of the country of immigration must take special effort to attract immigrant workers. Here I find most regrettably that many American trade unions make it difficult for immigrants to join. Social legislation poses a second set of tasks. The proposal of Dinah Dennis to demand a minimum wage should be supplemented with one for a limit on the hours of work. We must demand supervision of recruitment and, above all, regulation of the conditions on the emigrant ships. A requirement of a certain airspace per person in the cabins would make Chinese immigration in its worst impossible since the transportation would no longer produce a profit. Next was Takjiro Kato, the representative from Japan. As a representative of the Japanese socialists, I must take the floor on this very important question. When the Americans excluded us from California, they gave us two reasons. First, the Japanese workers were depressing the wages and living standards of the indigenous workers, and second, that we were taking away their opportunity to work. I disagree with this. Not only the Japanese, but also the Italians, Slovaks, Jews, and so forth do this. So why is it only the Japanese that are being excluded? The race question obviously plays a role here, and the Americans are clearly being influenced by the so-called Yellow Peril. The history of the United States confirms this opinion. Another factor is that the American capitalists want to flatter their workers. The Japanese are under the heel of capitalism just as much as our other people. It is only dire need that drives them from their homeland to earn their livelihood in a foreign land. It is the duty of socialists to welcome these poor brothers, to defend them, and together with them to fight capitalism. The founders of socialism, above all Karl Marx, did not address themselves to individual countries but to all humanity. International is inscribed on our banner. It would be a slap in the face to socialism if you were to exclude the poor, exploited Japanese. And finally, Julius Hammer, a representative from the United States Socialist Labor Party. There is no middle course in this question of immigration and emigration. Either you support restriction of immigration or energetically combat it. 
Gold Quit's resolution is an attempt at compromise that misses the mark. I especially oppose its third point, which envisages possible restrictions on the immigration of Chinese and Japanese workers. This is completely anti-socialist. Legal restrictions of immigration must be rejected. Nothing can be gained from socialism through legislative action or through collaboration with the bourgeois parties. The speaker cites several examples of how racial hatred in America blinds the workers and drives them to acts of violence. Japanese and Chinese could be very effectively organized. They are not as unskilled as you might suppose. They're becoming quite well acquainted with capitalism and are learning how to fight it. I ask that you do not approve any legal restrictions on immigration and emigration. We must create a great nation of the exploited. The Congress would not adopt Hillquit slash the Socialist Party's resolution, though they would not fully endorse the Socialist Labor Party's position of zero legal restrictions on immigration, which, in my opinion, is about the same as the modern slogan of open borders. The bits on the resolution on a minimum wage would be removed by Karl Kautsky and Rosa Luxemburg. Now, I was able to find the resolution in German, but after some searching, I found the weekly worker of the Communist Party of Great Britain actually published an English translation of it online. I will include a link to this in the description if you want to read it and see their article on it. But here's what the Congress adopted on this question. I'm going to read it in full because I've given up on the idea of making short videos. The Congress declares... The immigration and emigration of workers are phenomenon that are just as inseparable from the essence of capitalism as unemployment, overproduction, and workers' underconsumption. They are often a way of reducing the workers' participation in the production process, and on occasion assume abnormal properties as a result of political, religious, and national persecution. The Congress does not seek a remedy to the potentially impending consequences for the workers from immigration and emigration and any economic or political exclusionary rules. These are fruitless and reactionary by nature. This is particularly true of a restriction on the movement and exclusion of foreign nationalities or races. Instead, the Congress declares it to be the duty of organized labor to resist the depression of its living standards that often occur in the wake of mass importation of unorganized labor. In addition, the Congress declares it to be the duty of organized labor to prevent the import and export of strike breakers. The Congress recognizes the difficulties which many cases fall upon the proletariat in a country that is at a higher stage of capitalist development. As a result of the mass immigration of organized workers accustomed to lower living standards and from countries with a predominant the agrarian and agricultural culture, as well as the dangers that arise for it as a result of the specific form of immigration. However, Congress does not believe that preventing particular nations or races from immigration, something that is also reprehensible from the point of view of proletarian solidarity, is a suitable means of fighting these problems. It therefore recommends the following measures. For the country of immigration, one, a ban on the export and import of those workers who have agreed on a contract that deprives them of the free disposal over their labor power and wages. Two, statutory protection of workers by shortening the working day, introducing a minimum wage rate, abolishing the sweat system, and regulating homework. Three, abolition of all restrictions which prevent certain nationalities or races from staying in a country, which excludes them from the social, political, and economic rights of the natives or impede them in exercising those rights. Extensive measures to facilitate naturalization. Four, in doing so, the following principles should generally apply in the trade unions of all countries. A, unrestricted access of immigrant workers to the trade unions of all countries. B, facilitating access by setting reasonable admission fees. C. The ability to change from the trade union of one country to another for a free upon the fulfillment of all liabilities in the previous union. D. Striving to establish an international trade union cartel which will make it possible to implement these principles and needs internationally. 5. Support for trade union organizations in those countries from which immigration primarily stems. 2. For the country of origin. 1. The liveliest trade union agitation. 2. Education of the workers and the public on the true state of the working conditions of the country of origin. 3. An active agreement of the trade unions with unions of the country of immigration for the purpose of a common approach towards the matter of immigration and emigration. 4. Since the emigration of labor is often artificially stimulated by railway and steamship companies, by land speculators and other bogus outfits, and by issuing false and scurrilous promises to the workers, the Congress demands the monitoring of the shipping agencies, the immigration bureaus, and potentially legal or administrative measures against them to prevent immigration being abused in the interest of capitalist enterprises. 3. Reorganization of the transport sector, especially ships. 
the appointment of inspectors with disciplinary power recruited from the ranks of unionized workers in the country of origin and the country of immigration to oversee regulations, welfare for newly arrived immigrants so that they do not fall prey to exploitation by the parasites of capital from the outset. Since the transport of migrants can only be statutorily regulated on an international level, the Congress commissions to the International Socialist Bureau to develop proposals to reorganize these matters in which the furnishings and equipment of ships must be standardized, as well as the minimum amount of airspace for every migrant. Particular emphasis should be placed on individual migrants arranging their passages directly with the company without the intervention of any intermediate contractor. These proposals shall be passed on to the party leaderships for the purposes of legislative application and for propaganda. Now, as far as international reactions, Lenin and the Bolsheviks, as well as Karl Liebknecht, would release statements in support of it. Lenin characterized the struggle as between opportunists and revolutionaries. Most parties were fully in support of the actions of the Congress. The future Communist Party of America, in a report at a Comintern Congress, would make explicit the need to organize and stand with immigrant workers. This was considered a key part of the national question. However, the reaction in America would not be so positive. The party's right wing, represented by Victor Berger, who I mentioned earlier, he had announced Tilquit as being an intellectual who had betrayed the American proletariat that would permit Japanese and Chinese into the country, though he used less nice language, and declared that socialism in the U.S. and Canada, that they must remain a white man's country. Ernest Unterman of the center faction said that after class struggle had ended, it would be become a global race struggle and it would determine which race would rule the world. The party's left wing as well said that racial incompatibility was a fact. At a national executive committee meeting, Victor Berger warned that there would be 5 million yellow men invading per year, that the U.S. already had one race question, and if something was not done, the U.S. would become a black and yellow country. The meeting also declared the international had no power over the American socialists, and that at the time, the party must stand in opposition to Asiatic immigration. In 1908, at a party convention, a full-scale debate would occur, and the convention would adopt a middle ground declaration and say the race question should be saved for the next convention. In 1910, Hill quit at the Congress, too, would be attacked as being too progressive because he fought against a resolution explicitly codifying race into it. Victor Berger continued to be a racist and declared he would fight to defend civilization from Asian immigration. The Congress also moved to call for bans of anyone of a mongoloid race. I'd also like to point out that Victor Berger's Wikipedia page makes no mention of how racist he was in the slightest. Anyway, I'm sure you were wondering, where is Eugene Debs in all this? Well, he was not at a delegate to the Congress, but he condemned all proposals to limit immigration. He declared the positions on immigration that came from these Congresses to be unsocialist and reactionary, and said if any discrimination towards immigration should happen, it should restrict from the most privileged countries and fully encourage it from the most exploited. However... Debs generally thought the party unity was more important and never really mounted a fight against the anti-Asian and anti-Black sentiments in the party. Now, the Socialist Labor Party, on the other hand, was much more pro-immigrant. However, that does not mean they were not racist. They thought opposing lynching was not a task for socialists and that it was a petty bourgeois concern. If this is something people would like to hear me cover, um, I, I don't necessarily think it would be something I cover, but I think it would be good to have more videos covering just how racist early American socialism was and just how detrimental it was to the unionization of American workers and the development of a communist socialist movement in America. Well, thank you for watching. Hope you find this useful at least with showing the left has always considered issues of immigration important, even though at the time many reactionary socialists thought it was not an issue. The Second International, despite how chauvinistic it was, still wouldn't endorse anti-immigration resolutions. Anyway, I kind of enjoyed taking a break and talking about American socialism a bit. Always something I hope to cover too with this channel. A bit more frustrating because somehow accessing documents and stuff can be more difficult unless I'm willing to drive around the country to look at microfilms. Sorry this took so long to get out. I've been talking about it on my Twitter a lot, and just a mixture of getting sources together and a bit of that lockdown depression have kind of kept me from getting it out quickly. I'd also like to thank everybody who recorded audio for the uh, bit of the Congress debate. 